Hi and welcome to this week's Wu Wei Wisdom Life Lessons Teaching. It's great to be back with you all. So this week we are talking all about self-shaming and why we treat ourselves so badly. Now, are you always criticizing yourself or judging yourself negatively? It's like a part of your mind is never happy or never satisfied with what you've achieved, who you are and what you do. And often it may be that you neglect your own needs and self-care as a kind of cruel self-punishment because you believe you're not good enough. Well, in this teaching, we're going to be explaining what causes this self-shaming behavior, its origins in your childhood and how your inner child is involved now. And most importantly, what you can do today, right now, to move from a place of self-shame to one of self-love. Okay, David, so what is going on here with this self-shaming behavior? Well, I think you covered it in your intro re really well, because we definitely have the inner child involved in this. And so this gives us an opportunity in this video to talk once again about the inner child. So before we get into the depths of it, Alex, let me just clarify what I mean by the inner child. In our model, the inner child is a part of your mind. Now, you may want to call it your ego your subconscious mind. Some of my clients call it the little devil sitting on the shoulder, whispering negative things at them. But I prefer the definition of the inner child being a part of your mind. And it's a part of your mind that's been affected. And the relevant age for me, in my experience, is between the ages of six years old and nine years old, when something was going on in your cognitive awareness period, and it's kind of locked it You've locked it down. I love what the the Taoists say. It's like the the kernel of a middle of a knot. It's really tight, and it's that part of the mind that we have to try and access and get down to and give it the teachings that it needs. Because in this case, this is what we call in our model C C J: criticizing, comparing, and being judgmental. And I would say when I come across this with my clients, the majority is that they've been heavily criticized, heavily judged, compared, and been judgmental against when they were a child. I, but David, I guess a lot of people would say, I just don't see how, yeah, okay, I might have been criticized when I was younger. Things may not have gone been great. But when I'm down on myself right now as an adult, it's because there are really kind of shortcomings. I truly believe I look around and I truly believe I'm not measuring up in my relationships, in my career, in who I am as a person, my own kind of self status. I, it just feels like I'm blaming it on my childhood is like an excuse. No, no, you hit the head, nail it on the head. That's exactly what happens. But that's comparing. So I'm always mystified if you believe you're a spiritual, unique human being. How can you compare yourself against another spiritually unique hu as human being? This is just a learned behavior that came from that childhood. And all you're doing is you're carrying it on. You're you're holding the flag. You're doing exactly the same to yourself that others have done have, have done have done to you and so if you have this mindset and this is where it's really important for you to listen to this if you have this mindset the outcome i call it the self fulfilling prophecy if you keep on saying to yourself i'm not measuring up i'm not reaching the standards i'm not reaching my expectations and you're never happy, and we call it in our model, keep raising the bar, so you never jump the bar, because every time you get close to jumping the bar, what do you do? You raise the bar a little bit higher. And therefore, the self-fulfilling prophecy is you can never be successful, because you've set up the model in your head from a learned behavior as a child where you can't be successful, and then you prove your negativity. But are you saying... 
well, stop raising the bar, stop trying, because then I'm definitely never going to be happy. Well, now this is why the inner child. If you're definitely not going to be happy, then my question to you was, uh, would be, do you agree that you create happiness? So we're we back to the fundamental well, yeah. teaching. Well, yeah, I believe I do create happiness, but I believe that I'm, and I believe I'm taking self-responsibility for my own happiness and my own success by judging myself, because in a way, how else am I going to get out of this situation because you're judging yourself ne negatively so you can't get out of the situation mm -hmm. you're judging yourself against others so if you find somebody and say say for instance on your model if you were working with a company and you were judging you, yourself against colleague a mm -hmm. and you and you did better than colleague a guess what you'll do next week Judge yourself against co colleague B. Judge yourself against co colleague C. You can never, you can <laughs> never win this battle because it's a, it's like I say on many of these videos, it's like a donkey with a carrot dangling in front of them. They can never reach the carrot. You can never be happy because when do you reach that point of happiness? You can never be happy because when you when you beat colleague A, there's mm. colleague B, there's colleague C. You can't be happy. But if I beat colleague A, if it does feel like progress, I'm not saying it's like the complete solution, but there's a lot of people think there's part, okay. part I, there's a good, there's a mo good you? motivation can, there, you know, can I, can I just stop to keep trying to better themselves. But progress towards what? Ah, that's the good question, ah, isn't that's it? That's why I'm just trying to stop yeah. you. Because mm. this is you. What are you okay. progressing? Yeah, what's so, the, what is the summit? What's the top of this mountain that you're climbing, Alex? So the top of the mountain would be contentment and satisfaction. And how do you reach contentment that, and satisfaction? Because you well, create, you my, create. The logic is contentment and satisfaction by. having everything okay where I believe it should be in terms of who I am and what I'm doing and not, and therefore not being down on myself, not feeling ashamed of okay. that I'm behind or not keeping up. So I yeah, I can see there's, I can uh, see there's a lot of comparing going on and I can see there's a, like a false goal in there somewhere. I think you did a little tap dance as well because I think what I think what you should have said, David. This is obvious. When I'm perfect, mm -hmm. well, I think a lot of people think it's not about you know you talked about person beating person A or being better than person B. It's not about being wanting to be better than them. It's about believing that you're not flawed in some way. So I guess believing that you're not flawed in some way is what you've just said, which is believing you're perfect. Okay. But I guess Thanks. the inner child doesn't want to accept that, like, oh, yeah, I'm striving for perfection, because most people know perfection isn't achievable. Okay. okay. Is, is there anybody walking on the face of this planet that's not flawed in some way? No, but then the inner child always goes back to yes but i want to be less flawed <laughs> the inner child believes it's flawed so that part of my mind must believe it's flawed okay and is everyone else flawed yes but the inner child will tend to think everyone else of course, it's not perfect, but they're just less flawed than me. Okay. <laughs> and and how do you judge one unique spiritual person being less flawed than you are? How mm. do you make that judgment? Well, we don't make that judgment because, David, we are living in a society where we're not judging each other or thinking about ourselves even as individual, unique spiritual beings. We are living in a society and a culture that encourages looking at status, material, 
worth relationship mm-hmm. statuses. It doesn't mm-hmm. encourage us. It, yeah, it doesn't encourage us to think that way. So it's very difficult for people to mm-hmm. shift. And would you, and would you call? And would you call that a choice? Whether you choose to follow society's rules or you follow your own rules. Well, yes, it is a choice, but I think people don't believe they have that choice. And also kind of like the spiritual thing can seem very fuzzy and woolly and a bit, again, a bit like a bit of a cop out. So it's a bit Um, like, well, (laughs) if I can't raise my game and I can't feel good about myself in uh, normal status terms, relationship status, financial status terms, then I tell you what, I'm going to shift my attention and focus to trying to just think about everything spiritually. I've heard that's going to feel very like weak to people. They don't know what it means. It doesn't feel strong and powerful. Or they kind of poo-poo it. It's like, well, that's not as valuable. That's not as valuable as relationship status or economic status. So I I think that's totally around the wrong, the wrong okay. way. I think what's woolly is trying to follow society because you're following somebody else's rules. And if you agree that everybody is flawed, then you're, fl- you're following the somebody that's flawed. So you're following their flaws. This doesn't make sense. You're walking in other people's footsteps by your own admission. You're flawed. You're trying to build your worth and your value on society where society's worth and value is very woolly. What's what's society's worth and value? It's just what people's opinions are. And for me, spirituality is far more concrete and far more important and far more real because you are connecting down to who you really are. And, you know, in our model, we call it Shen. Shen defines as truth, honesty, and integrity. Of being the best that you can be is working from your integrity. Because if you're following other people, all you're doing is trying to walk in their shadow. You're waiting for crumbs off their table and you've already admitted that they're flawed. So why would you be following and trying to meet somebody else's standards who by your own admission is flawed? This is the part that's woolly. The part that's grounding you and should be grounding you in cement is reaching what is your true potential, being in your flow. Because if you're following somebody else, you're never going to be in your flow. Because as as I say, it'll be colleague A, colleague B, colleague C, somebody you meet, somebody who says something, somebody who passes something. Your value cannot depend on society. Society doesn't give you a value your spirituality is the only value that, mm. uh, that that you really have. And I think, David, I'd go further than that. I think our society and culture encourage us, encourages us to doubt our value in order to strive for more, to, well, to, to strive for a better house, <laughs> uh, to be better looking, to feel dissatisfied with ourselves. It really taps into the kind of ego and the inner child in that way. Well, well, of course it does, because we live, well, most of us live in a capitalist society about selling more and, and getting more. And what they're trying to do is to, is to, and this is the woolly bit, they're trying to say that you can never reach that highest level, the, the summit of the mountain that you're climbing, because the summit of the mountain that you're, that you're climbing is perfection is you do everything better than everyone else and you're the top of the heap. And that is just not possible. And if you keep on comparing yourself as a motivation, that is what we call, in again, in our model, the carousel of despair, mm. the hamster's wheel. You're going faster and faster and faster and faster. And actually, you're getting nowhere because you've taken your eye off your flow, off your path, and you're quickly following somebody else's. This is the wooliness of that model that you put uh, you put forward. First, you're, you're following someone else. Then you say, as you say, get a better job. You get a better job. Then you're going to need a better car. And then you need more clothes. Then you need more houses. Then you need this. Then you need that. 
And he's constantly on this carousel of despair, going and going and going. And this is the wooliness that then you can never be successful. And then you criticize yourself. You're living in self-doubt. You're mm. beating yourself up. You're trying to prepare yourself when people are self-critical, as you said, as in the uh, in the introduction, when they're constantly criticizing themselves, it's really for, for the inner child. It's like taking a vaccine because they're thinking, well, if I criticize myself, if somebody else does it, it won't seem so bad mm. because I've already done it. So it won't be so bad if somebody else does it. And then the, the wheel spins quicker. So what you're saying is our inner child sees the self-criticism and the judgment, self-judgment, and that constant inner narrative is almost the solution to the problem, but actually all it does is it makes the problem worse. And this is why it's the in, this is why the inner child. If you do the golden thread, well, this will always go back to childhood around that six to nine year old time period. It could be members of your family, could be your your mother or your father believing that if they criticize you, it would motivate you. They're on that model that you put forward, that if you criticize your child, it motivates them to do more. But of course, it demotivates them because they can never get any praise or value from their parents or worth because they're, they're on the hamster's wheel. Because whatever they do, if they came home from school with eight out of ten, the parent would say, well, why didn't you get 10 out of 10? You know, mm -hmm. what's going wrong here? You're not, you're lazy. You're not working hard enough. You need to pull your socks up. And so the child is constantly now trying and trying and trying because they believe that value, and this is the real root of this, the, they believe that value and worth is a commodity. So let me just spend a couple of moments. Mo most of us are brought up in a family unit where we are taught that if we're good children, if we do what our parents like, then they will be pleased. And most children, I won't say all children because there's always a, but most of us want to please our parents and want our parents to be proud of us and to smile and to say, well done, darling, you've done a good job. Now, what what the what the parents are doing in a very kind of basic way that if you do what I like, then I'll be pleased. If you don't do what I like, I'll be displeased. And the child quickly learns from a very very early age, but around this six to nine, it becomes more concrete that I have to earn value, praise, love, appreciation. I have to earn it. I have to do something. It's something that's given to me like a commodity. I often say to my clients, it's a little bit like an oxygen mask and they've got the control of the oxygen. But David, what about, I can see how what you're saying is poor parenting has created this uh, lack of self-worth as a for us in childhood. But what about if you've actually, you believe you've done something that you should be ashamed of and you are a bad person for it, either something you've done in your childhood or something you've done uh, as a kind of teenager or as an adult, what if that is, what if, if that is the, you believe is the truth of why you are ashamed of yourself and think you are just not good enough? Well, I think this highlights what I said earlier. I think at the root of this teaching is the idea of spirituality that we call Shen. So if you root yourself in Shen, then you have to accept that you are not perfect mm. and all human beings will only learn by making a mistake. And I accept that some mistakes are bigger and worse than, than others, but there's no way that you can live through life without making a mistake. Now, how do you view yourself about that mistake? And the problem with a lot of my clients is they're so hard on themselves. They're mm. so highly critical. I, I often say to my client, who is the judge and the jury? Because you've been committed to this prison sentence. How long does this prison sentence last? And for my, some of my clients, it will last the whole life. They will never accept 
that they made a mistake and they have to learn from the mistake and, m- and move on. And they're constantly on the carousel of despair, beating themselves up, finding fault. And the, the real issue for me is that this life of theirs, they are not reaching their potential. They are not in their flow. It's like they've moved off their life course and they've spent the time in this, if you think about water, I often think about water, as you know, the river, they're kind of stuck in an eddy going round and around and around and around, beating themselves up, doing self-fulfilling prophecies. Because if you have this belief, Alex, you can't be successful. Yeah. Because but, I, you, but do you think, though, some people do that and know that they are keeping themselves stuck as this form of self-punishment because they truly believe that, They've done something so unforgivable and they'll never change. And, if you know, if this happened in childhood, it may also be because they were told that they were a bad child and that they were a good good for nothing. You know, it's it's well, I guess for some people it feels like it may seem like an impossible leap of faith to all of us and say, OK, well, everyone makes mistakes and just forget about it. Okay. No, I'm definitely not saying that they just say, hey, everyone makes a mistake. Let's write, let's write it up because they've been on the carousel for some of my clients, 30, 40, 50, 50 years. But what you have to do is to go back down because a decision has been made that you made a mistake and now you need to be punished. So that decision is in action and working. So what we do with the golden thread, we go back down and we analyze that decision. Who's making that decision? What is the criteria? What is the expectations? Is your expectation, say, for instance, using your analogy, is your expectation is a child never makes mistakes and they should be punished for the rest of their lives? And I often use this, and this is something for those of you listening, you can do this for uh, for yourself. Imagine uh, you have a, a, a cousin, a, a niece or a nephew, and they come to you. I, I'll do this with you, Alex. And this niece and nephew is about six or seven or, or eight. And they come to you and they say, Auntie Alex, oh, my goodness, I've made a massive, massive, massive mistake. It's really big. I've done mm-hmm. something. I, 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 It was a complete mistake. I shouldn't have done it. I kind of knew I was doing wrong, but... It was just one of those moments. It, uh, I don't know what to do with it because I'm I'm guilty. I did it. I, I'm guilty. There's no arguments. I'm guilty. I was found out. I was seen doing it, and I'm guilty. Now, if your niece or nephew come to you, would you then say, well, I'm sorry, you now have to be punished for the rest of your life. You can never be happy now for as long as you live. And you have to step onto this, this this thing called the carousel of despair. And I'm going to push you on the carousel of despair. You can never come off the carousel of despair. And you're going to live your life on that carousel of despair. Would you say that to that uh, Because you, no one in their right mind, no one emotionally balanced or compassionate would ever say that to a child. But, but the, a lot of my clients would say that to themselves. Mm. And that's what you have to do. You have to do the golden thread. You have to look at the in, the the incident and what the child does. And that's why, again, I love the analogy of the inner child. I think it's so powerful. The inner child will only see through the lens. It's like a little peephole of a six, seven, eight-year-old child. And so you know, and everybody's watching this, children see things. Black, white, yes, no, right, wrong, good, bad, fair, unfair, unjust, just. They see things to the extreme. And so you they will view what they did if they did a, a bad thing in the extreme. Mm. But if you do the golden thread and you speak to the inner child, you can widen their perception and change their belief system. I just want to ask you, because in case we have uh, new listeners, when you say do the golden thread, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean Mm -hmm. by that in this context? Well, the golden thread is is a technique, and I think we've done lots of videos on this, and I think you put them into a catalogue. So this is something that you can do for yourself. It's a self-inquiry. It's very, very easy. So it has just has a very simple rules. The first rule 
is do you agree 100% that you create your emotions? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't create emotions. In emotions are natural and normal. I'm asking you a different question. And the teaching is, you are the creator of your emotions. You are not the victim of them. So the first question is, before you do the golden thread, do you accept that you create emotions? Now, a lot of my clients, even though they've watched videos and they've come on to book a quick session so I can just help them, they'll say, well, yes, of course I do, but... And that really is the key. You have to accept 100% that every emotion that you experience in your body, you have created. Someone else hasn't created an emotion and sent it to you. Emotions aren't floating around the room like a COVID virus going to attack you. It's, It's an emotion that you're creating. So once you've accepted that, then you start at the emotion that I would call a red light, a negative emotion. And then you can ask yourself, Why have I chosen to create that emotion? And that's the self-inquiry, why? And the only rule I'm doing this is please don't then use the word I feel. You've Mm -hmm. got to ban I feel. Replace it with one of these three. I believe, I think, I choose. So don't say, well, I create the emotion because I feel vulnerable. No. Repeat. I create the motion because I believe I'm vulnerable. Then you can ask yourself, why do you believe you're vulnerable? And that takes you down. And the golden thread is like a a thread that leads you down to your inner child so you can speak and work with your inner child because your inner child is not a monster. It's not evil. It's not out to get you. It's not out to mess up your life. It's a very scared inner child that hasn't had the emotional education. And it's our job to find them, to sit quietly with them, to answer their questions. And as I said earlier, rather than viewing life through a very small pinhole, but to widen their perspective on life and situations and their childhood and their families. And if, as you say, they did something wrong, you're widening that so they don't follow the patterns of their parents by criticizing CCJ, comparing and being judgmental. Mm -hmm. So if we begin with the surface level emotions or feelings, because actually we've had a few questions of clarification, are emotions and feelings the same thing? So yes, they are, albeit feelings can be emotional feelings or they can be physiological feelings. So it could be like a sickness in your stomach, a kind of headache, a tension, uh, a kind of unco- physical uncomfortableness that also can be created from it's not, the thoughts it, and the internal self talk you have. It, it, it just, uh, it's normally those feelings that you label things like anxiety, mm-hmm. scared, frightened, depressed. It's those type of feelings. Unhappy. Unhappy, yeah. those yeah. type of feelings. Yeah. So if someone, if a client comes to you on a session call and says, um, I, uh, I, I feel ashamed, I feel dissatisfied, I feel unhappy with myself. Uh, you know, I'm, that's the top level. And you're mm-hmm. saying... Change that, the word I feel ashamed to I create a red light feeling. Yeah, I, so then you're saying own it. I'm creating those feelings. Mm-hmm. Okay, if I own it and say, okay, it's not because of what someone's done to me or whatever, I'm creating those feelings... Then you're saying, why are you thinking about it? Why do you believe this? Why do you think it? Why are you choosing to create those feelings? Mm -hmm. And the client in this situation on this topic would say something like, "Um, because I'm just, I'm failing. I'm failing at my marriage. I'm failing in my career. I've got, I'm kind of low status. And then the conversation would open up and it would, if you dug deeper, it would get to, because I believe I'm not good enough. I've never been good enough. I'm not worthy. And then you're, when you're getting to that deeper level conversation, is that when you're talking to the inner child? that's, That's the inner child. When you get, when we call it the three lies, I'm not good enough. I can't cope. I'm unlovable or maybe unworthy. Same type of thing. Those are the three lies. When you hit the three lies, 
this is now your inner child talking. Under that three lies, there's what I call a vow. That's the kernel. The vow is will sound slightly different to everyone, but it would normally sound something like, there's something wrong with me. There's something missing in me. There's yeah. something other people have got things. What you were saying at the beginning of this session. So there's something missing in me. There's something wrong with me. So that's the first vow that we have to get to because there's nothing missing in you. You wasn't born with anything missing. And then what the inner child has done is constructed the three lies and then built on top of that. And so you have to deconstruct as all, as all of that so you can speak to the inner child. Yeah, because the inner child also, uh, the inner child's beliefs about yourselves are very generalized and they're very hard and extreme and sweeping statements. So our inner child wouldn't say, well, you know, when I was eight years old, I made a mistake no. and I can't let that go. Or what our inner child is saying is I'm a bad person. That's right. I'm a bad person. It's kind of, exactly. it's taken uh, making a mistake or a series of mistakes or being told that they've made a series of mistakes and done something wrong and then completely inflated it to, I am good for nothing. Yes. Uh, so that's absolutely right and well explained, Alex. It will normally, but not always, it will normally go down into family. It will normally go down to, par to parents, extended family, sometimes teachers. And when you're absolutely right, it will be a blanket statement. There's something wrong with me. I'm a bad person. I'm not clever. I'm lazy. I can't do things. I can't cope with life. But what? Well, what when you speak to the inner child and the skill is the inner child conversation and again we've done plenty of videos on that and i'm sure we'll do more in the future how you speak to the inner child and this is where a lot of our clients get it really wrong because they try and shut the inner child away and they see the inner child as an adversary they see the inner child as somebody they have to suppress shut down close down ignore and that is absolutely i can't be more clear than that if you do that you are putting yourself on the carousel the inner child needs to be helped educated needs to be listened to you need to open up that inner child conversation it's very important David, I think one of the hardest things for people is so that say we developed as children a belief that we were not good enough, that we were a bad person. Okay, so that was developed in childhood and that formed, that locked in that part of our mind that we call the inner child. Then we've grown up, but the adult part of us also is now hooked into society and culture which encourages us to doubt ourselves which encourages us to compare to criticize to feel less than so when we're trying to have this conversation with our inner child to say darling you know it's a misunderstanding you you are good enough you're a spiritual being there's no such thing as perfect giving it all the kind of healthy parental narrative that we should be giving it for a lot of people, their adult mind, their adult self, that parent that they should be, also believes that they're not good enough. So it's like, mm, I'm not kind of convinced on what I'm doing here. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, Alex. You're spot on. And that's why we do these videos, because the first person you have to speak to is the adult part, because this is – because. If you buy into this, then you're buying into, as we, you did at the beginning, you're buying into placing your value in what society whims, really. They just like whims blowing, you know, and, and, and you're constantly trying to find what society wants to please other people. And so this is about when if that case that you're talking about you would work first of all with the adult part of you because someone has to be accountable and self-responsible you have to formulate your own set of beliefs your values and that's why i think it's spiritual and i think that's what makes the wu wei wisdom model different to other models because we're basing it in shen your spirituality truth honesty 
and integrity. So, for instance, if you believe that society's model, if you're the adult before you do the golden thread leading to the inner child, if you believe that society's model is robust and the one you should be following, I would challenge you on that. Is mm-hmm. that truthful? Is that honest? Has that integrity? And then if it's not, why on, why on earth is the adult following that? I think a lot of people can get to that point and realise that, okay, this is not a truthful way of thinking and it's not helpful. I think what then a lot of people don't do is question as an adult, as a an adult with more life experience, question the beliefs subconscious they don't bring out into the open exactly. conscious open air exactly. the exactly. beliefs that they hold subconsciously about or the conclusions they've drawn about yes. maybe where they have done you know made a mistake in the past whether it's as a adult a teenager or a child it's almost like they've concluded their story for things that have gone wrong in relation to how they've behaved or who they are and they haven't taken self responsibility for going back and reinspecting that conclusion with the benefit of hindsight with the benefit of more life experience with the benefit of understanding that nobody's perfect including my parents who may have blamed me and chastised me for something we don't so although we can see society and culture is driving us to to a state of perfection that we can never achieve a lot of people make that leap of understanding but they don't do the self-reflection on the stories that they are holding very dear to about themselves the reason why they don't do that is 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 very easy really because they're basing their grounding their life and their decision making not in shen truth honesty integrity but they're basing it in emotion fear scared frightened anxious they're running away it's like a fight or flight they're in that mode was all the time because that's why they want to say i feel i feel this is one of the hardest things it sometimes takes a may take like a half of a session to get the person to stop saying i feel i feel i feel and i'm saying once you admit once you accept that you create your feelings it, i call it a B, C. A, what do you believe? What do you think? What's the ground? B, the emotions that those thoughts and beliefs create. C, the actions you take. I want you to base everything on what you think and what you believe. The grounding, is that truth and honest? I will say the majority of my clients, when they we first start working together, they don't do it grounded in what they think and what they believe. They're grounded in what they feel. That's yeah. what they're very good at. They they want to tell me, well, I feel this, like I feel vulnerable, I feel scared. And when, and when I say to them, well, what's the thought that created fear? They kind of look mesmerized. They don't understand. Well, you've got to get to that thought. So they believe and they and they're right also that the emotions and the feelings are real they are experiencing well, absolutely them. So absolutely <clears throat> quite naturally they're thinking well this is the problem this is not what we need to be talking about this is what i need to be focusing on i need to get rid of these uh, emotions and feelings exactly yeah it is a problem they shouldn't be there Exactly. But what they don't realize is actually you're looking at the symptoms, you're not looking at the cause, which absolutely. And it goes a step further than that, though, Alex, because then they say exactly what you said. Here's the problem, these red light feelings I call. I prefer let just explain that. I prefer to call them red light feelings rather than giving them a label, anxiousness, vulnerability, because that that takes you right way up. So here's the fe- here's the problem, David. These red light feelings. And then they try and focus on the red light feelings. They eat too much, drink too much, gamble too much, don't live their life, hide away, cover themselves away, shut themselves down, do all this CCJ, this self-sabotaging, pleasing people, thinking that if you please somebody, then somehow they're going to be happy and then you won't get a red light feeling. They 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 live their they live their life trying to 
walk on eggshells trying to see what other people think and that thinking that's going to deal with the emotion but they're not dealing with the root cause they're dealing with the symptoms and not dealing with what's happening and that's why that first teaching to me is life i would put it this important life changing if you're hearing this for the first time just think about this you are the creator of your emotions not the victim so let me just clarify because then people write into me, oh, you're saying we shouldn't have emotions. No, no, I'm not saying you shouldn't have emotions. Emotions are normal, natural. They make us humans. They're wonderful. I love emotions. But you create them. So if you ground your life in emotions, you're grounding your life in what happened, not what creates them. Mm. And so just to step back and recap where we've got to in terms of this undoing this kind of self-correction of what's going on. We need to shift our attention as an as the adult parent. We need to shift our attention from the emotions to the thoughts and feelings behind the emotions and start to question them. As the adult, as the mature adult now, we need to reflect back on the stories that we're holding onto about our mistakes who we are as a person, whether we're good enough, revisit yeah. those to then see a bigger perspective, not just a narrower childlike perspective on it or the younger us perspective on it, or just not to question <clears throat> what other people have told us. So we need to do that as the adult parent first before we can go and have an honest, authentic dialogue with our inner child. Yes, so the life lesson for this is you, you as the adult first have to see where you're grounding your decision-making, where you're grounding your values, where you're grounding what how you're decision-making. Account In my model, I call it accountability and self-responsibility. So you have to be clear on that first. And I'm saying for you to consider, if you don't like the word spirituality, which I'm not too keen, I call it shen, the definition of Shen is truth, honesty, integrity. What do you what What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And there's a little example I give to Alex. Would you say this to your six, seven year old niece or nephew? The answer should be what you say to yourself should be exactly the same as you said to your six, seven year old niece or nephew. No difference because that then, if there's a difference, that lacks integrity. So get that clear, then do the golden thread. Why, why, why? Don't let the inner child, because as closer you get to the inner child, the child will want to give you feelings. I feel, I feel, I feel. No, tell me what you believe. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you choose. Once the inner child gives you one of the three lies or something similar, I'm not good enough, I can't cope, I'm unlovable, I'm unworthy, then you know you're speaking to the inner child. Now here's the inner child conversation. Now you've got to find out where did he get, she get these values and views from. Normally parents, normally parents, not always, but normally parents. And it's, it's sometimes it's not even what the parent actually said. It could be the action of a parent. Like, for instance, the parent gets divorced and the father leaves the home. And this is very common. The inner child blames himself. Mm -hmm. Well, if if my father had really loved me, he wouldn't have left. If my mother really loved me, she wouldn't have left. Therefore, yeah, there must be something wrong with me. I'm a bad person. That's right. Or it could be uh, things we've interpreted in the silences and the body language of our parents. The role of the be, eyes. Yeah. The role of the eyes. The role or, of the eyes of, of a mother or father is very powerful yeah. for the for the inner child. Or if we believe that our parents have given our siblings preferential treatment, yeah. therefore our conclusion has been because I'm not good enough, I'm a bad person, I'm a less of less value, I'm ashamed of myself. Yes. Well, yes. I don't think a child consciously thinks I'm ashamed of myself. They just no. have the they just have the really uncomfortable emotions but i guess what you're saying is there must be a thought process going on there even for a relatively is, young child there there is always a thought process and it will always be extreme 
So giving the example, if a child believes, and it might be true, it might be true, that the mother is giving more attention to a sibling, then the inner child will swing and say, there must be something wrong with me. Yeah. So it's always, we talk about it, and we've done many videos on this, the emotional pendulum. The inner child is a master of the emotional pendulum, the two extremes. Wu Wei wisdom and being in, as in your flow is the center of that emotional pendulum. And that's where I want you to be, because there you will find truth, honesty, integrity. There you will be grounded in your Shen. There you will be grounded to know that you will reach whatever your flow, your potential is. Your potential is unique to you. I believe you're awesome. I believe you're awesome. And I'm not measuring that against someone else. I believe that you should follow your potential. And once you look over and start to look at other people, you're taking your eyes off your path and your flow. And I want you to be really focused on your flow and to reach your potential. Mm, thank you, David. And we've done so many teachings, and I can put links to the those in the show notes, which will help you with this kind of inner child conversation when your inner child is stuck on the belief of not being good enough, not being worthy, not being lovable. Um, so all those teachings will help you with this process. But I, I thank you, David. We've covered a lot of ground here. I hope this has really helped you unlock this um, debilitating mindset, which mm. can affect so many areas of your life. If you have enjoyed the teaching, please do let us know and perhaps share it with someone else who you think will also benefit. As David says, he works every week with clients all over the world on exactly these sorts of issues and problems that manifest in adulthood, but are so deeply ingrained with our childhood experiences and our inner child. If you'd like to learn more about David's one-to-one -one consultations via Zoom, I will also put a link in the show notes to learn more about those. And finally, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We produce new teachings every week and we would love to share your journey with you. Bye-bye.